Paul writes his letter to the Ephesians sometime around AD 60 to 61. And at that same time, he also writes Colossians, he also writes Philemon. And he sends all three letters with his courier, Tychius, accompanied by Onesius. And it's during this time that Paul sat in Rome, undergoing his first Roman imprisonment, making Ephesians one of the four letters that we call the prison epistles. So last week, we looked at Paul's second missionary journey, a journey where he made friendships with the people of Philippi. Today, looking at Paul's third missionary journey, we're going to see how he fares in Ephesus. To get to Ephesus, Paul took the road through the interior, all the way across Asia Minor, or what we would know as Turkey. And again, he revisits churches that he had already started. He checks up on them until he reaches Ephesus. Ephesus is a major seaport of about 250,000 people, all in the center of trade, either by land or by sea. Ephesus became a strategic location for Paul to spread the good news of Jesus. We're told he taught there, preached there night and day for about three years. In fact, he invested more time in Ephesus than in any other city. As was his custom, Paul would first go to the synagogue. He would speak to his fellow Jews, try to convince them that Jesus is the prophesied Messiah. And he would do that all the way until he was ordered to stop. <laughs> then he would shift his focus to a daily lecture hall, and he would move from house to house. According to records in Acts, Paul often used a very large room at uh, a local named Tyrannus. Modern archeology span has unearthed very large, very beautiful homes with wall frescoes and mosaic floors. So perhaps after three weeks of Paul traveling around, you might wonder, well, how does Paul fare in a multi-faithed world? And since it is a multi-faithed world, why does it seem like Paul gets so much pushback, right? Why does it seem like he gets so much opposition? Well, it's not because Paul is preaching about a new God. It was the fact that Paul is preaching about an exclusive God, meaning no other gods will do. It's not enough to just believe in Jesus, but the worship of Jesus means that you have to forfeit any other worship to any other deity. And in a large bustling metropolis like Ephesus, this creates citywide hostility. Located at the edge of the city is the world famous temple of Artemis. This was a monumental structure made entirely of marble and the largest structure in the Greek world. It took 10 years to build this. It was the size of a modern football stadium in height and width. It was three times bigger than the Parthenon. But today, this lone column is all that remains. In its day, it drew thousands of visitors and brought in a lot of money for the local economy. So who is Artemis? She is the goddess of the hunt. She would be the Roman equivalent to Diana. She is also the goddess of childbirth and motherhood. A giant statue of her was in the temple. And as you can imagine, her followers and Paul did not get along. Chapter 19, verse 24. A man named Demetrius, a silversmith who made silver shrines of Artemis, brought no little business to the craftsmen. These he gathered together with the workmen in similar trades and said, men, you know that from this business we have our wealth. And you see and hear that not only in Ephesus, but in almost all of Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away a great many people, saying that gods made with hands are not gods. 
And there is danger not only that this trade of ours may come into dispute, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis may be counted as nothing, and she may even be disposed from her magnificence, she whom all Asia and the world worship. When they heard this, they were enraged and were crying out, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians! So the city was filled with confusion, and they rushed together into the theater, dragging with them Gaius and Aristarchus, Macedonians who were Paul's companions in travel. So here we see the local silversmiths who make their living by creating souvenirs, saying, hey, this stuff that this Paul guy is saying, it's bad for business. Because Paul was preaching the exclusivity of Christ. Paul said that a God made by human hands is not a God. So the group turns to the crowd, the crowd turns to a riot, and they seize Paul's associates. Well, you know Paul. He sees hundreds of people all gathered together in the theater, and he wants to get in there. He wants to preach. He's got a captive audience. But his friends beg him not to go into the theater because it was just so chaotic. In fact, there were people in there, the Bible mentions, that didn't even know why they were there. They didn't even know what the commotion was about. They were just following the crowd. According to the Bible, during Paul's time in pagan cultures, people worshipped all kinds of gods. Within Athens, for example, having a large family of different gods, it could be in the thousands, including lesser gods and idols. So this is why when Paul is in Athens, in uh, Acts chapter 17, he talks about their unknown God. He says, for as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I have also found an altar with this inscription, to the unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. Paul made that his mission. Not just to preach about Jesus, but also to preach against other gods. And this was not his opinion, this was not his preference, and it's not just Paul's likes, right? Paul doesn't like Jesus more than Artemis. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. What does Jesus mean by this? He means that he is the only way to God. And by that, he means there is no other way. Artemis is not the way. Buddha is not the way. Muhammad is not the way. Krishna is not the way. Jesus is the way. Now, if a person doesn't want to believe that, that's their choice. But then that also calls Jesus a liar. John 14, Jesus says, whoever has seen me has seen the Father. In the woman at the well story, the woman says, I know that Messiah is coming. He who is called Christ. And when he comes, he will tell us all things. And Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. There is no other way to get to God except through him. That he is an exclusive savior. He is a universal savior. There is no other savior. He is the savior of all. There is one savior, Jesus Christ, and he is available to all people. Acts 4.12 says, Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. You know, surveys of the American population are telling us that your neighbors are more open to spirituality now than ever before. But this openness to spirituality is just as confusing now as it was in Paul's day. In truth, people are really interested in mysticism and goddess worship and Eastern myth or witchcraft as opposed to Christianity. I saw a bumper sticker that says, my goddess gave birth to your God. Today you have 23 different brands of ketchup. That's just about as much choices as you have with religion. 
I saw a TikTok where somebody was arguing that Jesus must have faked his own death and then walked out of the grave so that it could appear as if he rose from the dead. He ran off, eloped with Mary Magdalene, whom uh, he was having an affair with and got married. Hey, it's on the internet, so it must be true. Matthew 24, Jesus says, Watch out that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, claiming I am the Christ, and will deceive many. Why did the silversmiths want to stop Paul? Same reason he faced opposition everywhere he went. His testimony was a threat to their livelihood. Yeah, but it was true. What Paul said was true. Doesn't matter. People aren't interested in truth. Did you know that you cannot see the Great Wall of China from space? You can't. You know that cracking your knuckles does not give you arthritis. Your hair and your fingernails do not grow after you die. We do not have any record of Marie Antoinette saying, let them eat cake. But most people don't care about truth. Instead, they want to live a story that best serves them. Artemis makes us money. It doesn't matter that she's only a statue. The demon-possessed girl makes us money. It doesn't matter that we take advantage of her condition. The city officials already have an advisor. It doesn't matter that he's a magician and is more concerned about wealth than the good of the people. Paul stood in the path and he argued that truth mattered. Jesus says in John 6, the words I have spoken to you are spirit and they are life. Do you see? Jesus was not just saying that he was truthful or that his teachings were true. He was saying that he was truth in human form. He is the embodiment of truth. He not only spoke truth, he is truth. Truth is not a teaching. Truth is a person. So why was truth so important to Paul? Why can't we just believe that truth is fluid and it changes from time to time or circumstance? Or maybe truth is just fashioned by opinion. Oh, I don't know. Perhaps the same reason we don't rub mercury on people who have syphilis. We know the truth, that mercury is highly toxic and it can cause serious health problems. Have you ever heard the phrase, yeah, I need that like I need a hole in the head? Doctors used to perform trepanation. That's a procedure that involved drilling a hole in a patient's skull without anesthesia. And it was used to treat migraines or seizures and head injuries. You hear this? To cure a headache, to cure a head injury, they would give you a head injury. Hey, why is it important to believe the truth? Because a lie can be fatal. Your opinion can be fatal. Your feelings can be fatal. The truth is how we get in touch with reality. Without the truth, we cannot know a true and living God. If our lives are not built on a foundation of truth, then they are built on a lie. And then our whole life becomes a lie. I, I know we're heading into Christmas next week, and we're going to be thinking about the birth of Jesus, but let's just remind ourselves about his death. On the night that Jesus went to the garden, he prays for you. And he says, sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. What is truth? Truth is a person. You know, last week we read some of Paul's famous lines from Philippians. Here are some of Paul's famous lines to the Ephesians. Chapter 2, he says, For we are God's handiwork, 
created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. In verse 18, he says, For through him we both have access to the Father by one Spirit. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people, and also members of his household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. Ephesians 4 says there is one body and one spirit, just as you are called to one hope, when you are called one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. So, do you know why that temple of Artemis that no longer stands, it burned down? Well, surely it was such a great wonder and it brought so much wealth to the city after it burned down, there must have been a campaign to rebuild it. Nope. By that time, there wasn't enough interest. It's almost as if somebody had come into town and drastically turned the tide. Remember, Paul was there for three years. And that's not like him. In 1 Corinthians, he wrote, But I will tarry at Ephesus until Pentecost, for a great door and effectual is opened unto me, and there are many adversaries. Remember, Paul saw the rioting mob, right? They were in the theater. And he said, let me in there. And his friends held him back. Paul saw this place of darkness as a place of opportunity because he has the opposite philosophy of many of us. Christians don't want to run into a dark place. They look for the exit. They want to be in a well-lit area. There's so many lost people in our neighborhood. We should move. Did it ever occur to you why God put you in a dark place? The Bible says that you are the light of the world. What better place to put a light bulb than a dark room. If light bulbs could talk, put me any place but a dark room, I would say to that light bulb, then what value are you? What purpose do you serve? Paul wanted to stay until Pentecost because at that time, which is around the month of May, was the Artemis Games. And the whole Roman Empire would be coming into town. And Paul saw that as an opportunity. Acts 19 also tells how Paul started turning things around. Earlier up the page, it says some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists undertook to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, I adjure you by the name of Jesus whom Paul proclaims. Seven sons of a Jewish high priest named Sceva were doing this. But the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know, and Paul I recognize, but who are you? And the man in whom the evil spirit leapt on them, mastered all of them and overpowered them, so that they fled out of the house naked and wounded. And this became known to all the residents of Ephesus, both Jews and Greeks, and fear fell upon them all. And the name of the Lord Jesus was extolled. Also many of those who were now believers came, confessing and divulging their practices, and a number of those who practiced magic arts brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. And they counted the value of them, and it came to 50,000 pieces of silver. So the word of the Lord continued to increase and prevail mightily. How much is 50,000 pieces of silver? That's about one year's wages of 150 people. This is what truth can do. This is what learning the truth can do. The truth shines a light on darkness and it forces us to ask, what do I need this for? These people didn't look at the cost of the books that they were burning. Burning those books on witchcraft was their way of telling God, He's worthy of all of it. 
and it recognized that the books were lies and that he was the only way. And did you notice something else? Earlier up, it says the demons of hell knew Paul. It's funny. Nowadays, people, we want to be famous. We want more people to know our name. We want to go viral. We want to gain thousands of followers. But when did you ever hear somebody say, I want the demons to know my name. I want the devil to be threatened by my witness. In fact, if the temples of darkness burn to the ground after I've left there, people won't even want to rebuild them. You see, these are the side effects of preaching the truth. When you preach the exclusivity of Jesus, at the same time, you put the devil out of business. This week, either everyone is coming to your house or you are going to theirs. <laughs> and perhaps you feel a little bit like Paul, walking into a city of mixed beliefs and lies. Is Thanksgiving the right time to share your faith? What would Paul say? He'd say, let me in there, right? A light under a basket cannot be seen. So what can we do? I would always advise you to pray, right? In his second letter to the Corinthians, Paul tells us, the God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. So, as you gather with family this Thanksgiving, pray. Pray that the Spirit would soften their hearts so that they would be open to hearing the truth of the gospel. You want a prayer that echoes Paul's prayer for the Ephesians? He said, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people. You know, if talking about religion around the table is uncomfortable for your family or you know it creates division, I think praying first becomes all, more, all the more important. Don't just rush into a difficult conversation with the assumption that your good argument is going to win them over. Second, I would say accept them where they are at. Perhaps, you know, you raised your kids in a Christian home, but since they've moved out, they're seemingly abandoning their faith. Maybe look at this step and maybe you're worried. You're saying, well, accept them. I don't want to, I don't want to confuse that with condoning their behavior. Yeah, but remember, Jesus was so comfortable in the presence of sinners that they wanted to be around him. So much so that it hurt Jesus' reputation. The Bible says the Son of Man came eating and drinking, and you say, here is a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yeah, but it's, it's his acquaintance with them that creates an environment where they were open to the things that he was saying. This was not unlike his experience with the Pharisees. If Jesus could accept people where they were at, even though he's breaking his own laws, right? If Jesus can accept those people, then we can too. All too often, Christians judge and we express disapproval and we end up putting a barrier between our loved ones and the gospel. But the gospel is what is gonna change their behavior. Third, I would say, in conversations with them, don't take the bait. Don't sell your loved ones short. They know how a Christian is supposed to act. So act like it. When you respond negatively, when you 
get provoked and you get angry and upset, it's only gonna solidify their position. This is one of the reasons that they might go out of their way just to push your buttons. And during those moments, it's essential. Remember Peter's words. Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. On the contrary, repay evil with blessing because to this you were called so that you may inherit a blessing. Don't take the bait. You wanna create an environment where the good news of the gospel reigns, but that's not easy. Your family knows exactly how to push your buttons and to get the best of you. They are not going to fight fair. So we need to pray that any discomfort that we feel, any goading that comes our way, we respond with dignity and peace. Even if that means you need to politely excuse yourself so that you can go out of the room for a second and scream into a pillow. <laughs> Four, it's Thanksgiving, so let's focus on why you're thankful. Gratefulness provides an opportunity for us to talk and perhaps in a non-threatening way. You know, Peter encourages us to be prepared to give an answer to anyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. And Thanksgiving allows you to do that, right? Thanksgiving allows you to focus on gratitude. So what are you thankful for? You're thankful for the cross? You're thankful for grace? You're thankful that Christ forgives a sinner just like you? Maybe this year, instead of telling them why they are wrong or telling them why they need Jesus, maybe this year they need to hear your story. Why do you need Jesus? Tell them why you need Jesus. People are a lot less likely to respond negatively to a story that comes from your perspective, your thankfulness, and maybe just maybe, that creates an environment where a deeper conversation can be had. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the gift of creation, for the beauty of the earth, for the glory of the skies, for the abundance that we have. We thank you, Lord, for the gift of life, our life, the lives of all whom we treasure as family and friends, and the lives of all people who we count as brothers and sisters. We thank you, Lord God, for salvation that you offer to everyone through life, death, and the resurrection of your Son. We thank you for the gift of your Holy Word and for the Gospel, which is good news to those who hear it. We thank you, Lord, for this great country in which we live, for the freedoms we know, especially the freedom of religion, for the safety we know, for the rights we exercise, for the government of a people, by the people, and for the people. And as we celebrate, on Thanksgiving Day, we thank you for food and fellowship, for fun that we will share around the table with family and friends. And may we always remember that every day is a day of thanksgiving for those who believe in you. And may we learn to move away from regret and despair and discouragement and move towards thankfulness and move from thankfulness into mission from gratefulness into ministry as we love and serve in the next year. Amen. Hey, well, I would just remind you that we have a local church right here in Montgomery, right here in the Walden community, and we have two services. It's gonna be available to you all December long, all Christmas long. We want you to spend Christmas with us. We're gonna be talking about It's a Wonderful Life. It is, right? It is a wonderful life. We wanna share that blessing with you. We wanna tell the story of Christmas. Plan on bringing your family. We have two services available to you. We have one at 9.30, which is our uh, traditional service. We've got a choir, we're gonna sing hymns, we're gonna do responsive readings. It's gonna feel like the church that you grew up in. And then our 11 o'clock service is at 11, and we have a full program for your family from birth all the way through high school. We wanna celebrate Christmas with you. I'll see you soon.